Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Today, we will go over the advanced geometric properties, and this is the third in our webinar series. Today, we'll be discussing collimation, uh, which is to make parallel. So a uh, perfectly collimated light, a perfectly collimated um, object is a parallel object. So when we have a backlight, you know, kind of what we expect is we shine a backlight, light shines straight up. We put a sample in front of it, like a cylinder sample and it blocks the light, and this is the image that we would expect to get. However, we usually end up getting an image that is like this. So why is this happening? Why is the image not what we expected it to be? That's because light, backlight does not come straight up. When we put a diffuser on the backlight, it diffuses the light to make it more uniform, but it also makes it shine out in multiple directions. So at some point, there is going to be a light that can shine all the way down from this part of the sample, hit the top of the cylinder and go up to the camera. And that's what we're seeing right here is actually light wrapping around, hitting the top of the cylinder and coming to our camera. And that's why we're getting this image. So when we define the degree of collimation, we essentially are saying from a sample point of view, it's the angle where the light is coming from. So this low degree of collimation here, if I pick this, this point on my sample, and I look at all of the angles that the light can come from, this is a very wide angle, so I have a very low degree of collimation. Versus if I had something like this backlight that we can, we can say is more collimated, where the light is shining more straight up, I'm not gonna have the ability to get as wide of an, as wide of an angle on this sample point, and I'm gonna have a much higher degree of collimation. And just another example of what high degree versus low degree can look like, a high degree of collimation can give you these very sharp edges because there's not a lot of light coming from other angles to hit the top and wrap around um, and come to the camera versus this low degree of collimation has that wide angle so you're getting a lot more light wrapping around. So how do we achieve collimation? What can we do? Um, there are a few ways of doing true collimation, or there's one way of doing true collimation, which is doing it through optics. So the MFU and the MSU are our highly parallel optically collimated uh, lights. The MFU is our backlight, the MSU is our coaxial light. And what happens is there is a point source or a spotlight, and then an optical system inside to create a collimated light with a very narrow collimation degree. Um, so they, they're essentially collimating the light that comes out of the light versus fake collimation is where we can either adjust the size of the light, working distance, I'll go through all that, or use a light control film that just blocks the light that's not collimated. Uh, here's just a quick example so you can kind of see the difference between these two types of um, lights. The TH2 on the left with no LC film, nothing like that, just your standard backlight. Those are the defects that you would be able to see versus the MFU on the right is the collimated backlight. You can see a lot finer detail. You can see the detail that you can see with the TH2 is a lot, has a lot more contrast. So it's a very different, um, different image that you get. So before I mentioned there were ways that we can change the collimation and create a quote, fake collimation. Um, and one way of doing that is by changing the size of your light. So if you have a sample and you have a fixed working distance, you can't adjust it, but you're getting image like we see here on the, on the right where we're getting that wrap around. If we just make that light smaller, essentially just make the angle that the light can hit that sample smaller, we can start to cut off the light that can wrap around and we get more of a sharper image. So by just taking the same light and making it smaller, we can get more of what this image that you'll see on the right. Or if we have a situation where we can't adjust the size of the light, but we have room to play with the working distance, we can do that same principle. If the light is very close to the sample, there's a very wide angle that the light can hit. But as we move further and further away, that angle becomes more and more, or more smaller, um, decreases, and then we start to get images that look like this. So those are two really easy ways of kind of creating better images without changing the light that you actually have working right now. The other way is to use light control film. Um, and what light control film does is it comes in a horizontal and a vertical directions, and it essentially blocks light to create more parallel light um, coming out of the sample. 
So if you have a backlight, as we discussed, it shines out in multiple directions from any way because of the diffuser. But if I add a horizontal light control film, I am now blocking all of the light that comes out in a horizontal direction. So I have my light that's shining straight up and my light that's shining vertical. And then on top of that, if I add a vertical light control film, I'm now blocking all of the light in the horizontal direction. And now I'm blocking all of the light in the vertical direction. So all we have left is the light that's shining straight up. So this is kind of when we say a fake collimation, it's because it's not truly collimated via optics like the MFU is, but we're blocking light that is not parallel and therefore we're kind of creating a parallel or a collimation. So products we have that can kind of help us achieve this, um, our normal backlit backlight is the TH2. And then if we want to collimate the TH2, we can either add light control film to it or there is a TH2-PM model, which essentially has the built-in light control film. And then the MFU is that highly collimated backlight I'm, I've been discussing and mentioning. And then the last thing we have is an FEBL series, which is our um, big area backlights, and they can be up to 1.5 by 1.5 meters squared. So if you do need a very large backlight, that's a great option, and that can come with collimation um, filters and um, film as well. One thing I also want to mention is collimation is also applicable in front lighting. So when we talked about shadowless lights, the dome lights in the first webinar series, we always had a very low working distance, a very low degree of collimation. So we're able to remove all of those height changes, all those 3D features and get one flat image. But as we increase our working distance, we're changing the degree of collimation, making that angle a lot smaller and now we're able to actually see those 3D height changes and pull them out and make them very prominent in our images. So it's important to consider the light working distance that you're using most of the time. Um, if we were to try and see if the holes were present in this image and we just put our sample very low to the can, we wouldn't know that we had the right light because we didn't increase our working distance enough. Um, product lineup, any product kind of has those principles of needing to adjust the working distance, but the LFX series and the LFB series have the properties more obvious to them, um, where actually you can see very drastic changes when you increase the working distance. Um, the LFX V is the new version of the LFX3, which essentially is a different way of putting the dot pattern so that it's not as prominent in the image. And the LFV3 series has a nice feature that they've added where you can actually slide in um, the other diffusers, polarizers, or light control film right in front of the LEDs. And so you can use that to create the better image. If you need a more uniform light, use a diffuser. If you need to polarize the coaxial light, you can do that and put a polarizer filter there, which I'll discuss later on. Um, or if you need to either stop a little bit of light leak that might happen or just have more parallel collimated light, putting light control film here will give you more light coming straight out and less diffuse light. So usually we cannot know for sure which one of those will work best. We always recommend testing um, to figure out if we need to add like control film to the coaxial light or not. So that's kind of all I have for collimation. It's pretty straightforward, just making sure you're using the right working distance, the right size light. And if you really need a highly parallel, highly collimated backlight to see really fine defects, using the right light for that as well. Next, I wanna talk about polarization. So when light is pol polarizing, essentially, if you have light shines out, it oscillates in many different wavelengths in many directions. So what we wanna do is make that light only oscillate in one direction. So we add a polarizing filter and we essentially are blocking all of the light, except for in this example, all of the light that is oscillating horizontally. And if we add another filter, and we put it at the same, you know, we put it still horizontally, you're still gonna let all that same amount of light through. But if we rotate it 90 degrees, we're now blocking all of that light. So by putting a polarization filter on horizontally and then putting one on vertically, we're blocking all of that light. So you kind of think, well, are we blocking all of the light? Is my image gonna see anything? And what we find is that the direct reflection will not change the polarization state. 
Meaning if I polarize my light that's coming down, so I'm saying it's only gonna be in the horizontal direction and it hits this part of my sample and gets directly reflected, it's still gonna remain in that horizontal um, oscillation. So it's still gonna remain horizontally polarized and go into my camera while I, where I'll have a filter and that'll block that light out. But if I have that horizontal light come down and it hits a point on my sample where the light scatters, it actually changes back to its original state and oscillates in every direction. So when it reaches my camera, the it's essentially the same as having this image. Well, you'll get a lot of that light still shining through. It's not blocked off because it's oscillating in every direction now. So that's the reason why we still see light when we see our images. So I'll show here is a polarized light and or not polarized light. You see a lot of glare and here's after polarizing. So we can still see all of the scattered light, but we remove that glare, which is the cause by the direct light coming or the direct light reflecting off the sample. So that's essentially what polarization is doing. Um, a lot of people I know have used polarizers in the past and they know that it removes glare, but this is essentially the science behind why it works and why we use it um, and what it's doing um, to make our images you know, look more stable and remove that glare for better inspections. So that's actually all I have for the lab portion or for the pre presentation portion. Um, we'll do the lab portion next, but we'll kind of talk about all these principles in practice and um, go from there. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me for the lab portion of today's webinar. Today, we'll discuss how we use collimation to create better images and how we use polarization to remove glare from our images. So as you can see, I have a setup here. Um, all I'm inspecting for is a battery, mostly just a cylinder for dimension. When I first put uh, the backlight or the light over the backlight, you can see here that I have a lot of light wrapping around the cylinder. This would be very hard to have a clear, accurate measurement. So as I described in the presentation, I'm going to show two ways that we can increase the collimation without changing the light that we're using. So the first way is I'm going to start with by just making the light slightly smaller to cut off that angle. So right now we have a lot of light coming from the edge of this light. It's hitting the top of the sample here and going into the camera. But as I cover up the more light that's on the outside, there's no longer any light that can get that angle. So the closer I get, you can see that the more collimation I get and the light gets, or the sample gets more clear and crisp and this would be a much more accurate image to expect. So this light is even very small, so sometimes light does have to be very small to get the best collimation. But you can see on this image how much better it is compared to using that very large light. And all I did was just make my light look a little bit smaller. Sometimes though, we can't really change the light, but we can change our working distance. So if I take my light, I have a lot like wrapping around, as I increase my light working distance, less of that, I'm changing that angle that that light is hitting the sample, and I'm getting the same image I did as when I had just a smaller light, if you will. So here, just by either making my light smaller or increasing my light working distance, I'm able to increase the collimation of my light to my sample, and I'm able to get a much better image that would give me much more accurate results. My next topic is going to discuss how we can use light control film to also increase collimation instead of changing the size of the light or the working distance. So what I have here to demonstrate this is just a clear push pin, and we want to inspect for pieces that have flashing or extra plastic. So you can see when I put it on my, on my sample with just a plain backlight, this image is not terrible. It's not, um, you know, you can still see the edges, you can still get a good inspection, but you can see that as I add the light control film, it just gets a little bit darker in the middle and a little bit easier to see. And now this push pin looks almost kind of black to the camera, not as clear as it did with that backlight. Um, for good pieces, this is still not as obvious as to how much it improved the image. So now I'll put a piece that has some flashing on it and show you just how much it really helps. So this is a piece that has some very obvious flashing. You can see it in the image, but there's not that much contrast between that flashing and the backlight in my camera. So if I add one light control film, it gets a little bit better, there's a little bit more contrast, and then I add my second light control film and increase my intensity a little bit, that contrast of that flashing is just a lot higher. 
So just this small change can make your inspection that much easier and that much more reliable. So I'll put these two pins next to each other so you can just kind of see exactly how well this is working for that inspection. And then if I remove it and turn down the intensity, that's the difference between those two images. Sometimes you only need one piece of light control film, sometimes you need both. Usually testing is what determines which light control film we need, which direction, or if we need both of them. In this situation, we would recommend both just to get that really nice image of that flashing. Okay, so I have changed my setup one more time, and now I want to discuss essentially the difference in the image you can get from using just a plain backlight, a plain backlight with light control film, and the MFU backlight, which again uses optics to completely collimate the light. So right now I just have a clear plastic that I want to inspect for fingerprints, scratches, foreign material, anything. Um, so right now I have it set up for just the backlight um, at, you know, nothing special. You can see that there's kind of a scratch here, um, some foreign material here, but let's find out exactly how much we're missing by just using the backlight. So when I add a piece of light control film, slightly collimate it, you can see that those defects get a little bit more, a little bit more defined. If I add my second piece, they even get more defined from there as well. So you can see maybe up in this top right corner there were pieces that we couldn't see before that we can see now. So we can see that the collimation does help, um, even this scratch is more apparent. But I do want to know exactly what the MFU series can do. So I'm going to stop here, I'll set up the MFU, and then we can compare exactly the scratches on this sample. Okay, so as you can see, I have switched over to my MFU collimated backlight. And you can see on this image exactly how much better it is doing at showing those defects and even showing that fingerprint in the top left up there. Um, this collimation is optically collimated, so it's very, very fine, very parallel light coming through to really show off even those fine details that we were not able to see before. So that is the difference between using a normal backlight, a backlight with fake collimation, which lets you see a little bit more fine detail, and then a backlight with true collimation, which lets you see very, very fine details and very small things, even just a fingerprint on plastic. Um, so that's all we have for backlight collimation. Uh, we went through how to fake collimate with either a smaller light or a longer working distance. We went through how to use light control film to get collimation. And now we've just finished up using an actual optically collimated backlight to see even more detail. Uh, next I will talk about using collimation on front side applications and then we'll get into polarization from there. So I've cut away and I've changed my setup. Right now I have a battery that has some dents on it that we want to inspect for to make sure that they're present and or absent. Um, what I want to highlight here is using collimation in the front, in a front light setting instead of just a back light setting. So right here I have my light working distance is zero. My light is exactly on top of my battery. This would not be an optimal setup in a manufacturing scenario. But what I want to highlight is this defect in the center of the battery. On the left you can see it, but there's definitely a hole, it would probably get flagged. But that right, you can maybe see that there's a defect, but it's not glaringly obvious. So as I move my working distance further and further away, I am making those dents more and more obvious. To the point where now it would be impossible for the camera to miss this, and this is a much more accurate um, way to detect the dents. You can also see in the um, edged things, the CR2450, that gets more obvious as well as I get further away from the sample. So this is a situation where I like to point out that um, collimation, especially in front lighting, is very important. Because sometimes you can have the correct light, but if you don't have the correct working distance, then you won't know that you have the correct solution. So if I were to just hold up my coaxial light, put it here, and say, oh, that didn't work, and call it a day, I would have missed this great image I could get seeing those dents and made my inspection that much harder. Uh, one more thing I want to highlight about this LF or LFV3 light that we have. This end right here actually comes off and it has three slots to slide in either a polarizer or light control film or even another diffuser. So you can take this collimated backlight and make it even more collimated if necessary. 
um, or make it polarized if necessary. So that is a nice feature that they have built into this version of the light. It's very easy. You just unscrew the bottom and screw in the, you unscrew here and slide in your polarizer light control film or a diffuser to uh, make the image even better for what you need. So yes, as you can see, this, this applies for coaxial lights, but it also applies for other front lighting as well. The HPR2 light, which is a multi-angle light, the light working distance is important, even bar lights it's important, um, the LFX, the flat dome light, it's important there as well. So anytime you're testing for inspections, make sure you change your working distance with every light to see how that changes your image to go from there. So the last topic I want to discuss is polarization and just to show how well it can remove glare in images and kind of discuss what's happening to the light um, as we're polarizing it. So all I have here is just a package that's got very shiny material and we just want to inspect the barcode. Um, the shininess of the package can make that rather difficult. So you can see if I just set up my ring light here, I see a lot of glare coming in the middle. Um, and it'd be, you know, I can read the barcode, but it's just not a very good image. And as samples would vary, the glare could end up nearly anywhere and just be more difficult to read. So I do have a polarizer on my light already, and I do have a polarizer on my lens. They're just not lined up at the moment. So let's see what happens as I turn my polarizer to line up to be perpendicular with my polarizer on my ring light. So you can see all of that glare gets removed for a much even, much more even image that even as I can adjust, some glare is there, but still this would be a very easy inspection to read a barcode on, especially if you compare it to the image we had originally with no polarizer that's looking like this. So what's happening here is this light is shining down. There are certain um, angles of this piece that are perfectly reflecting the light from the sample back into the camera. So right now it's polarized on its way down, but it's not being blocked off by the perpendicular side um, of the polarizer on the lens. So when I make this lens perpendicular to the polarizer on the filter, that's when we can remove all of that direct light that's bouncing directly off this um, sample and going to the camera. And we only see essentially the diffuse light, which isn't causing us any problems and isn't causing us any glare. But sometimes, every once in a while, you get a sample that even if you have a great polarizer, you'll still see some glare. So if I look at this chapstick here, and I turn my polarizer off, or you know, make it unparalleled, you can see that there is a lot of glare in this image. And as I make it more polarized, it does a good job removing the glare, but there still is some glare on the top of the chapstick right here. So when there's glare right there, if we did need to remove it, what would our other option be? Because this is essentially the best the polarizer can do. So you can see in this image, all I've done was change my setup. I removed my polarizer from my lens and I grabbed my flat dome light. So you can see this image is a lot even and even as I rotate my sample, it remains even. Um, there's no glare on the top of this package as there was with the polarizer. So if you can't get a polarizer to work, we still can go back to this shadowless light that we discussed in our previous webinars to really make the whole image appear flat and remove a lot of those texture changes, even on clear samples. So that actually is it for the lab portion. Um, just a little recap, we reviewed how to fake columnize a light um, with removing the working distance, making the light smaller, or increasing the working distance. We discussed how to fake columnize the light with the um, light control film. And then we discussed actually the real difference between a fully optically columnized light and the fake columnized light. Um, we also discussed columnization from the front and making sure we factor working distance into even our front light applications. And then we did review polarization, really talking through what this light is doing as it's hitting our sample. And other methods of polarization just doesn't work on every sample and every rotation that it can come down the line. Um, I hope you guys have learned a lot from this, and I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this webinar with us. Stay tuned for the next one where we will discuss how to, um, the advanced techniques of wavelengths using the non-visible wavelengths. Otherwise, thanks.